Hey, it's Lula Mendesin and welcome back to the channel. I know you watched my previous videos and I'm sure you're going to really love this one. So if you are into politics or social issues, that's what I'm all about on this channel. That's what I talk about all the time, all day, every day. So if that's your thing, just subscribe and we're going to have fun. If you like the video, always smash the like button so the algorithm can do its thing. So today we're going to talk about something really fascinating, something that I learned about like... I think it's been eight years or something like that. If you know the Hidden Colors series, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, when I watched the Hidden Colors for the first time, like it blew my mind. I was like, how possible is this? Because, you know, when it comes to black history, they don't teach it in school. You'll never even hear about it in the media or anything. If there's a black discovery or something that has to do with black people, it will be whitewashed. So do you remember there was a sculpture of, I think it was Nefefiti or like... It was an Egyptian queen. When they made a model of her, she was white. So you never really see anything about black history in your media or anything like that. And what I'm talking about is the fact that black people were around the world way before. Like, okay, we do know that uh, South Africa, or even Africa in itself, is the cradle of humankind. So we do know that black people have been around all over the world. But they will never tell you that. In India, there have been black people. They are untouchables of India. So... We are going to watch a lecture from a doctor that's been in the hidden colors so many times. So we're going to catch a video from him and see what he has to say. So let's go. He's a scholar. He says, well, if you want to have a few brief words, we can go outside. So we went outside and she says she thinks it's about, she still is not looking at me now. Like I'm a pet and I don't warrant attention. And so she says, it's about 500 years old. It came from Egypt to Ethiopia, I think, and that the, black, the color black represents something profound. I was satisfied with that and ready to go. But it seemed like she now wanted to show us how much she knew. So she started talking about the crown and the arms and the clothes and how she was holding the baby. And I said, just to break the monotony, as if this is a segue to saying thank you very much, adios amigo, I said, you know, I've seen a few of these. And she looked at me for the first time. She says, really? I said, yeah. I said, I saw one and two of them in Russia. I saw one in Spain. I just saw one in France. Really? I said, yeah. She says, well, this one came from Egypt to Ethiopia, but it was most recently in France. I said, is that right? I said, we're in France. She said, Lupoy. I said, Lupoy? I said, I've been trying to see that black Madonna for 20 years. She said, really? And so the people started to gather. And I looked around, I was rusty, I hadn't given a lecture in a couple weeks, I figured this was my opportunity. So, the first image that he showed you, Dr. Rashidi is his name, if you didn't know, he was in the Hidden Colors. I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. You know, the white-bearded professor in the Hidden Colors. So, yeah, he talks about the Madonna and daughter, like, so, the Madonna is black. <laughs> so, it goes to show that even religion in itself even back then, especially when you go to Europe, you should see the Black Madonna everywhere. It's not really something really insane or anything that you will never discover. History is actually hidden, but if you actually go to Europe, there's an abundance of African history in Europe. There's more African history in Europe than there is in Africa. That's the most insane thing. So the Black Madonna and child, they're black. Everybody knows that. So yeah. <laughs> These are the black women in Turkey. Next. Next. This sister said I look just like her dead husband. I didn't know if I should take that as a compliment or I should <laughs> hurry and get my tea and get out of there. And they said all their husbands were dead. And then they looked at me and smiled. I said, where are you from? They said, we are from the Sudan. And we came here about 150 years ago as enslaved people. And I said, well, my ancestors came to the United States as enslaved people. And we both started to cry. They told me that about two years before, that a delegation from Sudan, some, from Sudan had come there and met with them and made a big deal out of it. The media was there, the press, everybody was there. But they never heard from them again. And so they kept saying, please don't forget us. Don't abandon us. They didn't have anything. They were agricultural laborers. And they said they were exploited and discriminated against based on their race. 
So slavery was happening in Europe, obviously, and Africans were taken from Africa and they were brought in Europe as slaves. And they're still there, but you never hear about this. But I think that even primitive tribes in Europe that are slightly might be black in a way, but not really full Caucasian, and they are there, you'll never hear about them. There are villages in Europe, if you don't know about it. Villages of people like just living in huts and things like that. But you never hear about that. And you'll never even hear about black people that are living in Europe and have been there for more than 200 years. And obviously, they think those black people will fade away. But these women are saying that they were dating black men and they're having black children. So they will never wipe these women out. And they're saying, never forget us. And I bet you, we will never forget these women. They are there and the black people in Europe are still there and have been there for 200 years and we will never forget about them. Know that India is very big to me. That India has the largest concentration of black people in the world something like 300 million and this is a phallic symbol from india i photographed this in a museum in pasadena next focus it now this is a nice picture right here and i picked this this was a postcard i picked up in amsterdam of a black child in india next these women are in northwest india they live in a state called Rajasthan, and I think that these are black untouchables in the Northwest. Next. This man is from another group of black folk in India. They are from a group called the CDs, not like compact disc CD, the people S-I-D-D-I-S. And these are Africans who were actually enslaved and brought to India within the last 12, 1400 years. So they are untouchables in India. I mean, this thing is so heartbreaking. Those people were the original inhabitants of it. I don't even know how it happened that the Caucasian looking like Indians came about in India. But the original inhabitants were pure black. They are untouchables. They are being discriminated in their own land as well by other Indians. Like, <laughs> it's the most insane thing ever. So these people have been there for a very, very long time. And some of them even acknowledge their African history. They say they, are, they came from Africa. So we need to really acknowledge these people. But obviously in mainstream media, there is no way in India they will display a dark Indian. Like, it's impossible. So their whole display is a light, fair-skinned Indian. So you wouldn't know about the untouchables. They are the most discriminated people in India. And you know what's the worst thing is that Gandhi, Mohammed, like Mahatma Gandhi, like, okay, I don't even care to pronounce his name properly because he was also very racist against black people. Mahatma Gandhi said we are the most filthiest people ever and we are not really intelligent or anything like that. That's the kind of racism that the untouchables are facing in India. Even activists hated them. So imagine if Mahatma Gandhi thought black people in Africa were savages. Obviously, he even thought the Indians, the untouchables in India were also savages. So racism goes in very deep. Even the most normal people are subjected to this. Even Mahatma Gandhi who was fighting activism, thought that black people were the worst people, which is really sad. Now, this is an image of a sister... I usually show her a lot, but I show her as an old woman. Her name is Truganini. These people were cut, up, cut in half, roasted alive, castrated, skinned alive, boiled in oil, kept in cages, kept as sexual slaves, you name it. The worst atrocities you could imagine was done to these people. And all of the books tell you that all of the, all the Tasmanian aboriginals were wiped out. Well, I found out that wasn't true that only the full bloods were wiped out, that certain of these black women were kept as sexual slaves by white men who hunted seals. They were British and they kept them and raped them and children were produced from those unions. So when I went to Australia, I met with the descendants of those original black people. Once again, a really, really emotional experience. The kind of horrors that the Tasmanians faced is the most horrific thing that black people have faced and it gets me thinking if all these horrific things happen to black people and these are the things that we happen to know about think about the horrors that happen to black people that we don't even know about and the one thing that they never really talk about is 
uh, in Australia, right, when they got them, obviously there were black people everywhere. The Tasmanians, they eradicated all of them. They killed them, all of them. And they raped their women. And obviously the offspring that came out are uh, not really the original um, Tasmanians. So another thing that they did, because there were so many black people, they tried to whiten, whiten them up. Because if you go to Australia right now, it's quite rare for you to see like the original people that lived there. They are almost white. Because... I remember uh, there were missionaries that came to my place, uh, you know, Mormons. So they came to my place. It was this other Caucasian guy. And I would say he, the other guy was Aboriginal. Because he looked, he looked like a beefed up man. Like, you know, those Aboriginal people. If you've watched rugby, you know, Australian and New Zealand rugby, you've seen those beefed up black people. <laughs> so he was one of those. I was like, oh man, this person is from there. And he's the original inhabitant. But when you look at him, he's almost caucasian but you can see that is black so most of the originals they had camps whereby they would breed out the melanin out of them that's how bad it was so you'd find that when you go to australia you'll never find like true true inhabitants of that place because most of them they are uh, i would say culture their culture was breeded out of them and they don't really have their original culture which is what white supremacy does at the end of the day. Leg, somebody wanted to smoke a cigarette, somebody wanted a beer. We were going from one place in Fiji to the other, so all of us got off the bus, and we were all doing our respective chores, and this little boy walked out. And everybody stopped what they were doing to gather around this child. What's your name? You so cute. Can I take your picture? Here's some money. And then after we left, we got on the bus, young brother said, Renoko. Dr. Rashidi something. What kind of message did we just send to those people? I really had to think about that. Now, I thought consciously that I was drawn to this child because he looked different. Or is that really why I was drawn to the child? Is it that deep in our psyche, we do believe that the lighter you are, the lighter your hair is, the, lighter you are, the more attractive you are, and we are drawn to people like that because we have been taught to believe that. One of the things that travel does is it causes you to confront yourself. It causes you to look sometimes deep within at values and concepts that you didn't even know you possessed. Okay, so that also speaks to my bias. Because as an African person in South Africa, I also have this misconception that a light person is more attractive. Is it really that I was indoctrinated from a young age that, you know, when you see a white person, a white person has fair skin so they are more beautiful or is it maybe something that uh, was the case even back in the day that when you're light skin they would prefer you i i, I don't know <laughs> if i'm making sense because women in the south sudan right now are the most uh, sought out models because they are tall they are thin and they are very dark they are so dark that when you see them um their skin really reflects the light they, they even glow <laughs> they shine that's how dark they are and it's so damn beautiful. But at the same time, when you see a light-skinned person, you're like, oh, they're more beautiful than the dark-skinned person. But is it because of white phenotypes? Because even in African nose, most people hate their African noses. When a black person has green eyes, oh my God, oh, you're so beautiful. So does it mean that black people have been brainwashed or is it the type of thing that we're thinking about even back in the day, even before we made Caucasians? It, it, is quite puzzling so you should reflect upon yourself as well is it because when you see a light person are they more beautiful than a dark person or is it because of their features or anything like that or because the dark person has more african features that are less attractive and the person with you know light skin maybe they might have caucasian features that are more beautiful you should ask yourself that question and these are the moors i don't know if i was here uh when brother norm and um the Mata folks brought me here the last time. I don't know if I showed this slide. But anyway, it's okay to show it one more time. These are Moors in France. The Moors introduced, uh, to my understanding, algebra, apples and oranges, and the concept of hygiene into Europe. White people at that time in Spain, white Spanish Christians, seemed to believe that it was a sin to take a bath, that bathing was a form of vanity, and some of these folk prided themselves that they never bathed in their entire lives. Okay. <laughs> so it would not be inaccurate to say that Africans taught white people to take a bath. 
Whether they did a good job or not, I don't know. <laughs> okay, this is quite a funny one, right? So there's this thing, even in South Africa, to this day, we have this thing that uh, most black people think white people smell. Like, <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a nasty stereotype. But I've experienced it myself. Um, this other day, um, in my office, like at work, right? Uh, I went into the toilet. And uh, on that day, there were white people there. And one of the white people went into the toilet. When I went there, like, there was this smell, bro. Like, I was like, what the hell is this? Like, what's wrong? Is it because they hate bathing or is it because maybe they sweat a lot? So maybe, you know, when you sweat a lot, obviously, you have to bath more often. And, you know, you have to put on fragrances. I think that's the reason maybe white people, um, I would say, like perfumes in a way. It's not like I'm racist or anything like that, but most black people have experienced this. And there's this other stereotype that, oh, black people, I mean, white people don't like bathing. It's, it's a thing. Like, <laughs> most South African people have that stereotype that white people don't like bathing. So maybe it's a historical thing. Maybe, you know, when your ancestors used to do that thing, you probably want to do it as well. So maybe it's a genetic thing. I don't know. And this is a moor in Prague in the Czech Republic from the 17th century. The, moor, the word moor means black. And the moors are described as black as pitch, black as a raven, black as a crow, black as ink, nothing white about them but their teeth. And after Spain and Portugal, they dispersed over much of Europe. And some people say, and I'm sure they're correct, that many of them even came to America before Columbus. Now, this is from a book that I purchased in Prague in the Czech Republic. I went to Austria. And I had a free day. I could either go to um, Hungary or um, the Czech Republic. And I went to the Czech Republic. I went to Prague. And I didn't like it. First of all, it wasn't a place for an African to be. I think it was Muda Baruka said, it's not good to stay in a white man's country too long. It was a white country. A few Senegalese there trying to make a living. But it was not a comfortable place. People were not friendly. So when you are having your debates on social media and you are debating a white supremacist and you tell them, oh, Moors were black and they took over Europe and you guys uh, pushed them out, blah, blah, blah. They'll tell you, no, Moors were not black. No, Moors were not black. They were Arabs. Oh, my God. <laughs> and you know what's the funny thing? White authors, white historians, they would tell you that Moors are black. They're black, dark black. There, there was this other scandal uh, years ago of uh, I think she was part of the uh, of royalty this other lady she was wearing this other necklace it had a, a mini pendant there it had a, a black person a dark person who was wearing a, a turban right and that was that was a more and most people were like oh that's so racist how can you wear something like that and most people didn't even know that was a more so black people did dominate Europe and white people do know that maybe that's why they hate us so much <laughs> They know their history. They know we went to Europe and dominated them. They were like, this is not going to happen ever again. We have to make sure we dominate these people to the ends of time. They're never going to dominate, dominate us ever again. So most white people, the white people in dominant um, positions, they do know their history. And they, they do know that the Moors were black. It's undeniable. And this is a Moor in chains in the Czech Republic in the 17th century. Next. Here you have, this is an interesting one. This is a man named Ibrahim Hannibal, or Abraham Hannibal. He is an African who ends up in Europe at the beginning of the 17th century. He is given as a gift to the Tsar or Kaiser or Emperor of Russia, Peter I, who takes a liking towards his child. I would like to think it was innocent. He sends the, the precocious little boy, he sends the kid, the child, to France for an education. And he becomes a general in the uh, Russian army. Now, apparently he knew he was going to have a military career because next he adopted as his emblem, go to the next slide, an African elephant. Now, Peter gave him the name Petrovich or son of Peter, which is the Russian tradition. But he took the name Hannibal the most illustrious African military figure he could identify with. Now, that's got to be an African consciousness there. This is one of his children. Next. But the most famous of his ancestors, or his descendants, is Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, 
who became the father of Russian literature, who bragged about his African ancestry. He was always talking about his great granddaddy. And he prided himself on that, on his African identity. He had a vocabulary of 20,000 words. He is the Russian equivalent to Shakespeare. Next. The kind of influence that black people had on Europe, it's undeniable. I mean, even in Russia, the modern Russian language, Alexander Pushkin is the father of the modern Russian language. And they will deny this. <laughs> they, will deny, they will deny it by all means necessary. I mean, the rest of Europe, the whole of Europe, the, the makeup of Europe was black people. And it's very hard for white supremacists to actually accept that fact. But unfortunately, the truth, when it's staring you in the face, you have to accept it. And I think that's the reason that, uh, you know, many white schools, they don't want to teach black history. Because black history is European history at the end of the day. So what did white people actually do at the end of the day? What did they actually invent? What if all the things that they actually invented, they were derivatives or directly were invented by the Moors? We don't really know because we haven't dug through our history enough to actually discover what really happened. In his study is an image of a black man breaking the chains of slavery 200 years ago. He was anti-slavery. He was pro-African. Imagine that, the consciousness that they, these brothers must have had. You get my point? Next. This is a statue of Pushkin. Next, black. And this is another statue of him in the city of, I think, uh, St. Petersburg. He's called the Russian Adam, the Russian um, springtime. Next. This is the black virgin of Paris. This is an image of a black Madonna in a church uh, a small church behind a big cathedral on the outskirts of Paris. I got this the last time I was there. You see Jesus with the little frizzy afro. It's blonde, but it's frizzy. And what she's holding is the national symbol of France. This is called the Black Virgin of Paris, and it's the most important of the Madonna figures in France, at least in Paris. Next. This is another image in that book that the Jewish lady in the Czech Republic wanted to buy. And this is another Black Madonna. Okay, so there's often this debate, oh, Jesus was, uh, was of a nomadic tribe, so obviously if he was black, some people might portray him as white, man, like Jesus was black, <laughs> and dark, dark black, dark, like bl so black that it's undeniable, because the concept of light-skinned black people is a modern concept, because even in South Africa, right, South Africa is not really a uh, hot place is not really that hot because even in Lesotho there's no Cape Town it's snowing right now we're in the middle of winter it's pretty cold so Africans the original Africans Africans were pretty dark. <laughs> dark, dark dark so dark that you can't even deny it the person is so dark that there's nothing light about them but their teeth <laughs> so that's the whole thing so he was not even really light he was not brown black 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 Jesus was black, guys. There's no denying that. It's pretty obvious. Even the Virgin Mary is dark, dark, dark. And this, this statue is right there in Europe. If you go to Europe, you'll see these things. But if, of course, we'll stay in Africa and say, oh, no, we didn't do anything. We didn't invent anything. Black people were nothing in history. Here's your proof. Image of one of the three wise men. In the European Middle Ages, it was a popular thing to paint the youngest of the three wise men as an African. You can go to New York and go to the Bronx. This is in a museum called the Cloisters Collection, affiliated with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's my picture. Next. And here's a close-up. Next. Now, here's an interesting one. This one is also from England, and this brother's name is John Blanc. And this is a painting in the early part of the 16th century. This was the greatest trumpet player in Europe. He was the personal trumpet player of Henry VIII. And he won music awards in Westminster, England in 1511 AD. Yeah, so even one of the three wise men were, were black. So <laughs> at this point, everyone was black in history, bruh. Everyone was black, which is logical because how can you deny that because even if there was no proof there was no evidence that in history black people had an impact we were everywhere even to this day black people are the dominant people in the world there are more black people than any other race and check this 
if a white person uh, were to go into the sun a lot, they have freckles, right? Freckles, black dots. Those black dots are telling you that you're black. <laughs> So originally, even white people's skin is telling them, dude, you have to turn black, go back to your ancestors, that's who you are. So at the end of the day, the whole world should be black, logically speaking. So another thing that uh, is not really surprising, yeah, there was a black uh, trumpet player in Europe and he was amongst the best. So musically, black people have always been dominant. Like every music genre right now in the world, there's black people. And even classic music. Even though we don't know the origin of, or origins of classic music, but I bet you the most came up with classic music. It's just that we can't really tie it to them. But I bet you many in, musical instruments and everything. Because we have to remember, Europe was like, a, um, I would call it, it was apocalyptic. Nothing nice was happening in Europe because, before the Moors got there. So they advanced the whole civilization. So are you telling me the Moors went into Europe and advanced Europe, but... You know, the white people there ended up coming up with the music. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. So, it, obviously, it does make sense that a black person was the best trumpet player out there because black people have invented every genre of music in the world, even in the current world. This is a black saint from Brazil, and he's standing on this white man. I don't know who it is, but I figured you guys would like it just because. Okay? This is a black saint from colonial Brazil. Next. A black man in colonial Mexico. Next. Benjamin Banneker, who designed the city of Washington, D.C. A lot of the children knew Benjamin Banneker. Next. A black girl from a group called the Gariganu. The Gariganu are Africans who claim they were never enslaved. They live in Honduras, Guatemala, Costa Rica, uh, Belize. Next. Also a sister from, these are my own pictures. These black people live in a place called Sambo Creek. You know that's a black community. But white people own all the stores in Sambo Creek. Next. From Colombia. Next. From Panama. Next. From Belize. Next. From Mexico. Today. And this is the last slide. This is a sister, I think, who doesn't get much play. Her name is Queen Mother Arlie Moore. Have you ever heard of Queen Mother Moore? A Garveyite, a reparations activist, and I know if she were here today, she'd be working with Praxis and the African Rights of Passage organization, and she'd be a member of MATA, and she'd be down in the front row saying, where is all the people? So someone once asked, how do you take someone's land without even removing those people from their land? You just lie and tell them that they're from somewhere else. And that's the biggest lie that the American people have experienced. The lie that they come from Africa. So yeah, some of them do come from Africa, but not the majority of people. Look at Brazil. How many black people are in Brazil? There are too many. Like, how would they have brought all those people from slave ships? There are too many. <laughs> so, but that's not the main debate that uh, proves that black people um, were already in the Americas. You just have to ask them. Ask the most, you know, go to the deepest jungles of the Americas. They'll tell you that, no, we are from Africa. We descend from Africa. Even the Hawaiians will tell you that we descend from Africa. We came from Africa. Our ancestors told that we are from Africa. So, and they'll tell you that we didn't come through slave ships. We were there. We were here way before that. So, in America, they'll tell you that the Red Indians are the ones who actually are the true inhabitants of America. But black people were there way before that. They inhabited America way before. But you need to take their land, right? So you have to tell them that they come from Africa, all of them. So they won't even claim their land. So you have to change their surname, their history, everything. So everything that we know about black history in America is from the books that we are reading. And the same books that come from the dominant society. So how do you trust all those books? That's why there are a lot of people who do their own research. And I want you to do your own research as well. Go into history books. These things are not even hidden. When, when they say it's hidden history, it's not even hidden. You can find this even in Europe. When you go to Europe, you'll find so much history about Africa. Because most of the artifacts that they have in Europe, they took, it from, took them from Africa. 
and unfortunately will never claim those things ever again because even in france they have a law that says we cannot claim our artifacts so we'll never get them back but we can go to europe to actually study all these things and actually study what really happened in the past it's not really that hard to find this information even a google search you can actually find all of this so but anyways i really hope you um discovered some new information from this video if you're you don't agree with all of this if you are denying scientific proof Go to the comment section and tell me how much you disagree with me. If you like the video, obviously like it. If you want to go to my social media, just follow me at Lula Manderson, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, the whole shebang. I still have Facebook. You can also go follow me on Facebook, add me as a friend, and we can have a talk. But for now, it's Lula Manderson. Shop, shop.